Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. Your Fed decision with Mike McKee. It's 50, and the promise of another 50 basis points in cuts by the end of the year, and another 100 basis points in 2025, which would put the nation's benchmark rate at 3.4%. It's projected to fall another 50 basis points in 2026, which would put the rate at 2.9%, which is now the Fed's median forecast for the neutral rate. That is up a tenth from June. The consensus is GDP will rise 2% this year, down a tenth from the June forecast. Growth will be the same in 25 and 26. Unemployment will hit 4.4% this year. That's an increase from the June figure. It will fall to 4.3% in 2026. PCE inflation of 2.3% this year falls to 2.1% next year and hits the 2% target in 2026. Though inflation remains, quote, somewhat elevated, the statement says they cut because they now have greater confidence inflation is moving sustainably toward their 2% target and the risks to inflation and the labor market are roughly balanced. While they do not explain why they decided on a half-point reduction, the statement says the committee is strongly committed to supporting maximum employment. And remember, in Jackson Hole, Chairman Powell said any deterioration in the labor market would be unwelcome. There was one dissent from Governor Mickey Bowman. It's the first dissent by a Fed governor since 2005. It is the first dissent by any member of the committee since 2022. The statement adjusted to say the committee will, as always, carefully assess incoming data, quote, in considering additional adjustments. There's no changes, guys, to the QT portion of the Fed's policy. Mike McKee, stay close. We'll come back to you. Here's the price action in response to it. Knee-jerk reaction is the first move. Might not stick, but this is the move so far. Up by eight-tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. The overwhelming outperformance on the Russell. The small cap's now up by 1.7%. In the bond market, just bear in mind, we've come a long, long way. And we've priced in a lot to this yield curve. The two-year just climbing just a little bit to one change to 360 at the moment at the front end of the yield curve. And in the FX market, dollar yen dropping back by about 0.7%. So that's a weaker dollar, a stronger Japanese yen. Lisa, 141 on that currency pair. Yeah, now over to the Bank of Japan. And if they hike, how much does that divergence continue? I also want to point out gold. You're seeing a bid into gold right now. We start to look for some of the inflation proxies. So will this sort of feed into that idea? I thought it was interesting. The long end of the yield curve just on the margins, not significantly, yields just slightly up on this idea that they're going to go bigger and potentially even more down the line. So the median dot can mask some disagreement beneath the surface. So let's talk about the range and not just the median at the FOMC. The median dot for 2025 in the projection materials that were just published is 3.4%. The range for 2025 is anywhere from 2.9 to 4.1%. 2.9 to 4.1. That's quite a range on this FOMC. And I think for the first time in a long time, we have some dissent playing out publicly as well. The first dissent from a sitting governor on the FOMC since 2005. This was not a unanimous decision. And it really highlights uh, why this actually became such a knife's edge kind of decision. Just to add to that, 10 officials penciled in 100 basis points or more of cuts for this year. Nine officials penciled in 75 basis points or less for this year. It actually matters quite a bit for market expectations, especially given some of the policy uncertainty next year. So, TK, we get 50. We get 50, and now we're waiting for the next act. It's a news conference in 26 minutes' time. I think it's a surprise. Within the zeitgeist, this is to the edge a surprise. I think Powell maybe alluded to this with his enthusiasms at Jackson Hole. You touched on something Jason Furman touched on this morning, which is don't forget the dollar. And Mohamed Alarian, I'm going to be as direct as I can, is the great unknown unknown here a dollar weakness that anybody without great hair doesn't know? Um that we may not know. I think we've, we've seen it before. I remember, I remember periods of dollar weakness. Um, but it is dollar weakness. This is not just a 50 basis point cut. This is a dovish 50 basis point cut. Well said, yeah. Right? I mean, if, now, I agree with you, John, that the dovish part comes from the median dots. But if you look at the range, it doesn't look as dovish. But that's not what the market is going to hear. The market is going to look at the median dot and will interpret this as a dovish 50 basis points cut. And the first reaction was actually a steepening of both 2s, 10s, and 2s, 30s, which tells you something um, about what people are worried about. To some extent, this median dot validates market pricing coming into this decision. Is that sufficient? 
I'm looking at equity market reaction right now. We're up by a half of 1%. We've still got a news conference, a question we've asked for the last several weeks into this. Are we going to end up with disappointment on the other side of this news conference with Chairman Powell? What would your question be now? So first of all, normally he's more dovish than the statement. So that's going to be pretty hard to do um, this time. But, but let's wait. Um, you know, my question is, will be, what has changed since July when you decided not to cut rates? And now there's this very aggressive cut and aggressive signaling. What has changed? The speech in Sintra, Portugal at the start of summer, very different to what we're hearing from the FOMC just several months later. Joining us now to discuss is Bob Michael of JP Morgan Asset Management. He joins us out of London this afternoon. Bob, we just want your first impression to the decision. What do you make of it? It hit on pretty much everything we were looking for, probably a little less dovish than we thought in two instances. One, there was a dissent, so it wasn't a slam dunk, and we would have liked to have seen the median dot for the end of next year, somewhere around two and three quarters to three percent. But otherwise, as we had been guided over the last week, nothing to quibble about. Bob, which bond series or individual bond provides the most information right now? Is it a real yield? Is it the nominal full faith and credit? What's of the most value to Bob Michael right now? Credit spreads. Credit spreads will tell us whether investors believe the economy is in dire shape and this was an emergency 50 basis point cut, or whether this is just a Fed a long way from neutral, perhaps as Mohammed hinted, a meeting or two away from where they should have started the cycle. So they're starting to get towards neutral. All is well. Okay. All is well. And yet what we saw earlier this morning was an increase in mortgage applications. What we've seen is already the bond market pricing in all of this and then some. And basically the statement only encourages that even more. Do you not see a risk of potentially reignited inflation, Bob, that we could potentially see expressed in the long end? As Mohammed was mentioning, we are seeing that yield curve steepening in a way that hints that something else is amiss, especially when paired with gold. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We're a long way away from that. We're looking at the three-month annualized rate of core PCE running at 1.7%. So that's not inflationary. There's signs of disinflation everywhere. When you look at the labor market, they talked about full employment. Well, the low in unemployment was 3.4%. A couple months ago, it was 4.3%. That's up nine-tenths of a percent. You only see that when there's threat of recession. That's characteristic of that. They've highlighted to us that the neutral Fed funds rate is somewhere around 3%. That's a debate we could have for a long time, but it's nowhere near five and a quarter, five and a half percent. So they can start taking pressure off of businesses and households without reigniting inflation. Bob, I know they call you Bob Michael, but you told me earlier it was Bob Michel, so I'm going to stick to Bob Michel. Uh, <laughs> Bob, speak Mohammed, I came to London because I thought we were going to QPR Millwall on Saturday. <laughs> now you're in New York on me? I am, I'll be in London tomorrow. <laughs> so, so, Bob, speak a little bit to the revisions in the projections and particularly unemployment. What do you make of that? Um, I didn't catch them. What did they do? They, they, they pushed it up. I, I, yeah, I, I, I think they have to. I think they have to acknowledge that we're at a challenging time, that, that there are new entrants to the labor market, but those are still unemployed U.S. workers. And they have to acknowledge that we're not below 4% anymore. We're heading a little bit higher. And that's why you need the policy response to start with 50 basis points. I'm OK with that. Yeah, but Bob, I think we've got to talk about this a little bit more. And I'm pleased we went to unemployment. Unemployment right now in America is at 4.2 percent. These are the Fed's projections out in 2024 year end, out to 25 and beyond. They've got projections of 4.4 percent, the median projection for unemployment this year. Next year, they've got it at 4.4 percent. Given the move we've seen over the last 12 months, Bob, how aspirational is that? How realistic is it that we just kind of pause around these levels for the next 18 months? Well, we very well could. If, if we get 225s over the next two meetings and we bring rates down 100 basis points, what we know is there's still a shortage of housing. There are first time home buyers queued up 
to buy homes. So bringing rates down could bring those buyers into the market. We also know that a lot of businesses don't fund themselves in the public bond market. They fund themselves through bank loans, through private credit. Those are floating rate loans. Those are anywhere starting with SOFR at five and three eighths percent. You take 100 basis points off of that, that could help to stabilize things as well. Just because unemployment has headed up over the last year doesn't mean it has to keep going. It can certainly flatten out here if the Fed does its job. Hey, Bob, appreciate catching up as always. Bob Michael there of JP Morgan Asset Management. There's a couple of moves in this market that I think are very, very interesting. We've just gone 50. And in some ways, the dot plot is validating what we were pricing in this market ahead of time as well. And what you're seeing at the long end is the long bonds sell off and yields climb by two basis points. It's not a big move, but it's notable. We're up by two on tens on 30s. We're up by three. And at the same time, we've got gold at all time highs. What is this market sniffing out? Well, it's sniffing out on the margins a greater inflationary risk than otherwise priced in. Look, I could make an argument about how it might mean that we're going to suddenly get run away into 70 style inflation. That's not what it's saying. But what it is saying is that on the margins, the idea of a bigger and uh, frankly, a dovish 50 basis point rate cut really highlights how inflation is still back on the table, at least on the margins. They're talking about a dual mandate imbalance. Mohammed, your impression is that it's a single mandate central bank now. And you don't think we should take our eyes off the other side of the mandate. Do you think the market's speaking to that just on the margin this afternoon? I think at the margin, yes. But I do think that this is the reaction of a single mandate Fed right now, um, especially if you believe 2% is your inflation target. Let's cross over to Diane Swank and bring her in of KPMG. Diane, we'd love your thoughts on the decision and then we can get into the nuances. What do you make of the 50 instead of the 25? This was a huge victory for Jay Powell, who really laid out at his Jackson Hole speech that he was worried about employment. And that is what this is about. And Mickey Bowman doing a dissent, Powell willing to take a dissent among the board members as opposed to among a president. That is how much he wanted this half percent rate cut. And I think that's very important. I think you're going to see it couched and explained within the context of several participants at the July meeting thought they were ready to go ahead and cut. So this is a bit of a catch up to that. And so that should help temper a little bit this dovish read on it. I was surprised that they kept the risk balanced, although clearly the focus is now on employment and not allowing the situation in employment to become much right. worse. Remember, we're at 116,000 payroll gains, three-month moving average as of August. That's not statistically different from zero. Combined with the downward revisions we saw on August 21st, the day before Powell gave his remarks at Jackson Hole, those downward revisions, record downward revisions, even if they're not as large as they appeared because of some immigration that we're not capturing, they're still large. And it means the birth and death rate, the death rate of firms has picked up and their small businesses aren't hiring as much as well, which could mean actually the payroll data for this year also gets revised down and that's what they're worried about. Diane, uh, your work out on LinkedIn has been just hugely beneficial, a really holistic view of the U.S. economy. I have a Dow Jones Industrial Average, bottom of the pandemic, up 128 percent, 21 percent per year. I've got debt and deficit that Hal Bronner and Bernstein never dreamed of. Diane Swank, is this a Fed just dealing with our stimuli? Is this a Fed just dealing with debt and deficit to the sky? You know, we've had everything you could possibly imagine pushed up inflation. And now we're seeing it come down despite the fact that we still have a lot of debt. So, you know, the, on the margin, yes, we do have high debts. And I do believe we need to deal with that at some point in time. And I don't think we have anyone who's willing to talk about it on either side of the aisle, which is another issue. And we can talk about that at, at a later date. But right now, we've got a Federal Reserve that's no longer buying that debt. And you've got a Federal Reserve that is seeing inflation come down despite the fact that we have high debt. And that's because on the margin, after we get past the sort of six months that we put a whole year budget into um, from March into October 1st, you get a continuing resolution at best through year end. And you're going to get more constraints on spending, I think, as we get into 2025. Diane, one reason why this comes as a surprise, this decision, 
One reason why is because they could have telegraphed this more carefully. There was no data that really moved the needle between uh, the time when the quiet period began and now that would shift us toward 50. Why do you think there wasn't more clear communication that this was a Federal Reserve ready to cut rates by 50 basis points? Well, frankly, I don't think that Jay Powell, by the time the blackout period hit, had the votes in his pocket to be able to do that. And I think we saw that in some of the mixed messages, even the day of the blackout period. Chris Waller, governor on the Federal Reserve, had said, you know, you'd be open to a more aggressive rate cut. But he didn't seem to be really ready to do it in September. We saw John Williams come out that same day and sort of talking about more cautious rate cuts, more of a quarter point kind of rate cut. So they didn't telegraph it because he hadn't corralled the cats, but this really does speak to the fact that he does have an extraordinary ability to actually do just that. Let's get to this quote from No Data of Renmac, just out at the moment. Here's the issue. The balance of risks have changed. In June, most saw balance risk to unemployment. Right now, this has completely flipped. Most see risk to unemployed skewed to the upside. This will not be the last time we see a 50 in our opinion. Lisa, your thoughts? This is basically what's being priced into this year. I mean, how else do they get to more than 100 basis points potentially by the end of this year? And if you think about it, it raises a, a lot of questions about what they are seeing that suddenly makes that such a consensus, given that we've gotten a lot of mixed messaging. Let's head back to London and catch up with Bob Michael at JP Morgan Asset Management. Bob, I'm sitting there in cash. I've been sat here for a long time. You've been warning me for a long time that I face real reinvestment risk. The Fed's just cut 50 and I'm freaking out. I give you a call. I'm now worried about another 50 and maybe another 50 after that. What are you buying on my behalf? We're telling clients, just get into the bond market. Just get into a general bond fund. It could be an aggregate investment grade bond fund. It could be a core plus bond fund if you're in a high tax bracket. Get into a general municipal bond fund. Yields are coming down. Yields are at this level with $6.3 trillion in cash building up and most people not liking the bond market. Some buying has brought it down here. And this money will come in because they're going to watch the return on cash go down like power windows. I got to say, Mohammed, this goes to the point that you were making. I'd love your comments on this, this idea that the Fed uh, was seeing something that made him shift his view. And what we're seeing right now is that maybe he just didn't have the votes. I'm just trying to wrap my head around what that means going forward, that maybe they're going to be even more aggressive than the market previously thought, and that maybe it is appropriate to price in even more uh, spread compression, even more uh, yields going lower. So it would not surprise me if that is the market reaction. It would not surprise me at all because the market has been conditioned to ask for more and more and, and gets more and more. So it wouldn't surprise me if that, if that is what happens. Um, I will go back to the significant dispersion in people in FOMC members' view as to what the destination looks like. And that dispersion has got to be reconciled over time. So I don't think it is as clear cut as the market will make it seem. Uh, Diane Swank, I got eight ways to go here. Let's try this. You've got a wonderful reading of America away from three zip codes in Manhattan, the quadrants of Washington, D.C. This rate cut, how does it affect America that are not the elites, not the people enjoying NVIDIA to the moon? Well, this is really important because the rate cuts, the short-term rate cuts, are what come through on loans that consumers take out. This is beyond the mortgage rate situation. This also helps the mortgage rate situation, obviously. But the real issue for consumers are short-term interest rates and how they are priced on their debt. Now, on the credit cards, the average credit card rate is about 25%. This is a rounding error on that. It's not going to help a lot on that. That's just incredible how high those rates are. But when you get into auto loans, when you get into other kinds of loans that consumers take and businesses, middle market through small businesses, it affects all those loans. And right now, you can imagine a lot of people are going to get some relief in terms of that. Now, the good news is there's not a lot of overhang of debt for consumers, and they can service the debt they've got. But for those lower income households that have already exhausted all of their savings and then some, this is 
good news. They rely on lower rates to buy used vehicles. They can't even afford to buy new vehicles anymore. That goes right up into middle income households. So that's where we'll see some movement, but it's not immediate. You're not going to see the Fed also understands there's lags. And I think Muhammad, Ali, Muhammad is right about the issue of the market front running when the real message here is that this was not signaling that we're ready to cut, 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 cut. This is a window of opportunity to cut now, catch up on July. That's important. But this isn't a signal that they're ready to go half percent, half percent, half percent, sort of continuously. And the election is an uncertainty. That is not factoring into the decision today, but it is an uncertainty in terms of policy for 2025 and 2026. And that could change the trajectory for the Federal Reserve once that cloud of uncertainty regarding the election outcome in the U.S. is lifted. Could not agree more. Dan, just one of the best, as always, a clinic. Diane Swank there of KPMG. November 7th could be a very, very different meeting. If you are just joining us, welcome to the program. 25 or 50. We got 50 from this Federal Reserve. The outlook? <coughs> Unclear. 10 out of 19 officials favoring lowering interest rates by at least an additional half point over the remaining two meetings of 2024. And the next meeting in 2024 could be very interesting if we do indeed have in hand the outcome of the presidential election. Matt Lazzetti of Deutsche Bank joins us now for more. Matt, your first reaction to this one, please, sir. We get 50. Yeah, I think it's all about uh, the message and then we hear from Chair Powell about the reaction function as we look ahead. You know, as we were thinking through, uh, if they go by 50 basis points, what is the communications challenge for them? I think it's two things. One, they have to project confidence in the economy, positivity in the economy, so they avoid a negative confidence uh, signal. And then two, I, I think that they want to send a signal that this is not the new norm, that they're going to be uh, ratcheting down to 25 basis point increments. And as I look at that dot plot and, and the skew for, for this year, it does seem that there's a pretty pretty strong um, kind of consensus around going 25 basis points from here. I think 18 out of 19 dots showed uh, only an expectation of two more 25 basis point rate cuts or less. Um, and so I think Powell can paint this as a one-off. It was meant to right-size monetary policy to a lower inflation environment, ensure that right. the real rate does too much and to really show that uh, kind of actions speak louder than words in providing confidence on the soft landing. Matt Lizzetti, the 10-year real yield just printed below 1.50. To me, that's a huge signal coming out of the pandemic. What does a diminished real yield do for American business, American finance and investment? Look, I think we should expect that the you know, the goal of this is to keep financial conditions easy, to ensure that financial conditions don't over tighten and put a soft landing in jeopardy. That is ultimately the legacy of Chair Powell, and I think that he took out some insurance against that today. I think that's a, a good outcome for, for the economy. Hopefully he can message it in that way, which is they have a positive outlook. This is not the, the starting of a 50 basis point cutting cycle. And I think if you get that, soft landing pro prospects improve, financial conditions ease, and we have a very uh, good outcome for the economy. Matt, one of the stickiest areas of inflation has been the housing market. And what we've seen there has been recently an uptick in mortgage applications, as well as uh, just in general, some of the home lender stocks. How quickly could you see a transition from a market that is completely flat on its back, not shifting around, moving at all, to one that is robustly price discovering it to the upside with people given renewed confidence by lower rates? Yeah, you know, we got mortgage purchase applications this morning, and they, they did show a tick up, a, more driven by refinancing activity than purchase activity. It does seem to be lagging a little bit the move in the mortgage rate so far. My, my own view is I think that's driven by when you look at the University of Michigan or Conference Board, so many consumers expect rates to come down over the next year. And so that, that has to happen, as, and maybe as rate cuts happen and as mortgage rates fall further, that really does unleash activity in the housing market. That would present upside risks for, for the economy. You know, I think the reality is, Q2 growth was 3%. Q3 growth is tracking near 3% according to the Atlanta Fed GDP. We look at consumer spending on a three-month annualized rate. It's the highest that we've had since 2011. We got a robust retail sales report this week. So, you know, th th I think Chair Powell should present a picture where the underlying economy and fundamentals are resilient and strong here, but they were taking decisive action today to ensure that those, those outcomes continue. Hey, Matt, final round before you go. Question for the chairman in this news conference. What's your number one question? I think it's all about reaction function. So you know, the fact that they went by 50 basis points today before seeing very weak outcomes for the economy will naturally raise questions um, in the market about what if you get a weaker jobs report? Do they go by 75 basis points or not? So I think it's all about the reaction function from here. And, um, you know, how does he respond to that? Does he kind of set a high bar? 
either for another 50 basis point or even uh, uh, higher rate cuts. Matt Lazzetti at Deutsche Bank. Bob Michael at JP Morgan Asset Management still with us. Bob, you love asking this one too. So I'll ask it for you. What's your question for Mike McKee in this news conference a little bit later on this afternoon? Has the concept of an equal, equilibrium long-term neutral uh, Fed funds rate um, expire? Do we need that anymore? Shouldn't they be talking more in terms of a real Fed funds rate, maybe minus 1% to plus 3%? I mean, for goodness sakes, in my career, I've seen the Fed funds rate at 0 and 20%. So trying to target something like that is nonsensical to me. Hey, Bob, got to catch up as always. Bob Michael at JP Morgan Asset Management. We get 50 from the Federal Reserve. The price action looks like this, up a half of 1% on the S&P 500. In the last hour, Lisa printing a new all-time high on the S&P. Which uh, really is in line with what some people were expecting, although disappointment they did not get. If you want to take a look at whether this is a Fed that can outdove market expectations, it seems like they did. And the projections going forward really highlight how this market likes to run ahead of even where Fed pricing is. Just look at this. If you take a look at Fed fund future pricing, we're actually pricing in a 4.1% Fed funds rate to end this year. So we're talking about uh, an additional almost 100 basis points of additional cuts from here, 150 basis points of cuts, which just, again, points to why a dovish 50 base, basis point cut has made a difference in this market. Mohammed, you alluded to this. If they go 50, the pressure will build to go 50 again. Is that what's happening? That is what's happening, and the market loves this. And it's, it's been the repeated um, conditioning of the market. Give it something, it will want more. I look, I, I look at this late in the press conference, John, when we get to the political questions. Like if I was to parachute John into the Elarian Institute of Behavioral Economics and Policy. Would you behave? The first I would behave. And the answer is there's two United Kingdoms out there and there's two Americas out there. And he has to address within his neutrality and the political debate, those two Americas. It's not just about Bob Michael and the portfolio on Park Avenue trying to figure out what to do next. How does he navigate some of those issues, Mohammed? How difficult is it to set policy for two very different experiences in this economy? It's very difficult. It's even more difficult when politicians are shouting- Go 75. Go 75. No, it is, it is really difficult. What's not clear to me is if he is actually buying insurance, what is the cost of that insurance? What is the downside? of buying insurance. You know, insurance is hardly ever costless. So w what is the downside of having bought insurance for the economy? And that's something we'll only find out over time. Well, what's the cost of buying insurance for the economy, but also for the Fed and for uh, its political independence and its reputation therein? I just wonder if it's more difficult to make the decision now on November 7th, now that you've had this initial 50 basis point rate cut, and you have a market that's now saying, yeah, you could do another one in November. Yeah, and, and, and that, that was the argument all along, start in July, don't get yourself in this situation, but it, it is what it is, and they're now going to have to navigate this. I think Powell is going to be very clear. He'll say we are not impacted by um, political issues, just like he will say that he is blessed, to use his word, by lots of <laughs> opinions from outside, but ultimately it's what they decide in that room. And they will get lots of opinions after this one. In just a moment, two minutes away, Chairman Powell will walk into that room and give us a news conference for the next 60 minutes or so. We'll take that in its entirety on Bloomberg TV and on Bloomberg Radio. Lisa, things could be very different on November 7th. We've said that repeatedly. I don't think you can overstate it. Things could be very different. The outlook for 2025 could shape up in a rather different way dependent on what the complexion of Congress looks like, how divided things are in the nation's capital. And whether or not we even know at that point, as Amory likes to say, uh, whether we have a decision. Uh, it just will be interesting how much, this is the three-part act, we get the third at part of the act coming up moments away, how he characterizes what this insurance policy is really for. Is this because they are seeing true weakening in a labor market that otherwise is kind of hanging in there? And that, I think, is one of the key questions. How do you expect him to frame it? Is this a one-off mid-cycle adjustment, a wait and see, we'll regroup in November? Or is this the beginning of a one-way trip back towards what they think is neutral? Could it be both? I mean, right? Is there basically, can he, everyone have their cake and then eat it too? Because essentially you have inflation coming down and you have an economy that is in a trajectory that typically does lead to further weakening. Is it history that can actually make sense at a time that has defied a lot of historical precedents? It's going to be a, a really difficult one for him to really uh, It's tie. going to be difficult because they're coming out of a pandemic and they're making it up every meeting and every day and every speech, John as they go. They're making this up as they go. 
today they catch up maybe is the right way to put it. But the then what of November and into 2025 is real. We certainly all agree on that. We've said this a few times. We've all been humble through this pandemic and coming out the other side.